Hey guys, welcome to Paleontology, where we will be learning about how fossils are made. Unfortunately, not how we can bring them back. <laughs> Alright, let's go ahead and get into our lecture. Today, like I said, is lecture 8. We'll be learning about paleontology. Let's start out with what paleontology is. Uh, a lot of people guess different things. Some think it's the study of bones, or just fossils, or dead things. So and overall, that is the gist of what paleontologists actually do. Paleontology is the scientific study or history of life on Earth using dead things. These dead things help describe diversity patterns through time, uh, evolution, and speciation can be documented in the remains of life itself. To do this, scientists look at bones, echinoderms, vertebrates, and invertebrate species. By calculating how the number of species through time changes, you actually look in the fossil record and look how, let's say we have a nautilus here that looks like X, and then we have a nautilus here that looks like X combined with Y, and then we have the nautilus that looks like Y. That is how it will change over time, which is how you get things like speciation, which is the change of a species. For example, you have hobby horses, and they're all living in this great big field. And then one day, there is an earthquake. So let's, let's do this. Quake that separates them. Okay, and on this side, mountains rise up. And on this side, it gets really dry and becomes more like a desert. On the side that's more like a desert, the hobby horses that are short and quick or tall, that are tall, are going to survive better because they can fight off uh, potential predators. They can reach higher to get leaves like a giraffe. Whereas on this side of the mountains, we ended up with a lush forest. Over there, your tall, big hobby horses are going to die out for the smaller ones who are able to hide better in the underbrush. How do paleontologists study this ancient life? Like I said, they study dead things. They study the remains and traces of ancient organisms. This can include footprints, it can include poop, it leaves. Fossils, impressions, casts, original materials, or traces of any organism preserved in the lithosphere. A fossil could be an original skeleton or shell. Uh, this doesn't have to be replaced by other minerals, and examples of this are shells you even find at the beach. Bones, skeletons of coral. Shells at the beach could be hundreds of years old because they don't decay like soft body parts do. We also see the burrows of ancient organisms which um, means that, you know, like how a mole burrows underground and creates a home, that gets infilled and preserved, and we're able to find that later. Uh, we have imprints, or casts, or molds. Uh, mold is when an organism is trapped between layers of sediment, the sediment hardens, and the remains of the organism actually rot away, leaving a cavity, or and a perfect cast, which can then be infilled by water, which will deposit minerals, forming the cast. Trace fossils like leaves, or... A carbon film is left behind where the rest of the leaf has actually disappeared, it has rotted away. And so let's talk about fossilization. This is the process of making an organism into a fossil. It's actually quite rare. Uh, fossilization is not something that commonly occurs. It requires very specific environments to allow for preservation. A dead organism first needs to die. <laughs> let's go back a second. Um, and it needs to be able to be covered by sediments and essentially burial. So first you need a living organism, it has to die, hands down. An organism needs to die. Did, okay. The next part you need is for it to rot away, leaving skeletal remains, right? And during this, it should be covered. Okay, some sort of event needs to happen that covers it, and this is rare. And that's because an event could cover it with sediment, and then shortly after, another event could come and remove the sediment. Uh, burial then continues, leading to a fossil. It's essentially the gist of how this all works. What remains typically become a fossil, though? As we saw earlier, we have fossil of... For example, like Kabuto becomes Kabut Tops, and then we have Amistar. These were all fossils we found in Pokemon that we brought back to life and created them with. But what did we find them as? We found them as a fossil, right? That means your fossil had to be made of something. When you looked at the fossil of like Kabuto and Amistar, Amistar looked like a shell 
and Kabuto had the head of Kabuto, right? What was preserved in there was not the soft tissue body parts that we see right up here, these guys. It was actually the shell, the hard parts of that became the fossil in the first place. What remains typically become a fossil? Again, hard parts. Hard parts are things like shells, chitin, bones, teeth, exoskeletons, like the exoskeleton of a, of a beetle. Um, soft parts end up rotting away, which is why scientists don't necessarily find fossils with skin or flesh still intact unless we're looking at very specific and special circumstances. What conditions promote fossilization? Let's take a look at that. Fossilization is promoted, is um, ideally is that you have to have rapid burial. Okay, um, different things have a set time period they have in order to be fossilized or they can't be fossilized. Um, for example, footprints last hours to days before they are gone. Um, leaves take one to two years. Bones will start to decay in a matter of weeks between different insects breaking them down as well as various plant life. Um, shells are the most resistant. They take thousands of years to break down, which is neat because that means that the shells we have on the beach or that we have in our own yard or even in the parking lot at HCC uh, could be thousands of years old. And in fact, many of them are hundreds of years old. But um, the conditions that promote fossilization in particular is rapid burial. Right? You have to have this happen fast. Ideally, your location of death would be close to water, but not rough water. You want something calm, not something that's going to have rapids. Uh, you also need a low energy environment. A low energy environment, meaning that you're by, let's say, a lake or a slow meandering river instead of something that's continuously up in the mountains going really, really fast, has rocks in it and rapids. You need calm areas with slow moving streams and rivers, or in some cases, a bay. You need fine grade sediments. Uh, these are larger grains or cobbles. Don't work very well. They're actually going to hurt the material instead of helping it. You don't even want stuff that's this rough. You want it to be soft like sand or mud or silt that's going to be covering them. Now let's go over types of fossils. We're going to start with body fossils. These are the, the first ones. Um, and these include things like bones, uh, which are going, again, hard bits like knit claws, teeth, the physical bones. The next one is shells. Again, they're very hard. Um, another one is skin. Uh, this particular dinosaur was found completely intact with skin. It had actually fallen into water and was covered in mud, which preserved it. Um, and then we have feathers. I don't know why this got so small. <laughs> uh, but feathers, feathers is another big one. And then we have trace fossils. Remember, trace fossils are things that are left behind, like footprints or poop or um, gnaw marks. Uh, this is a coprolite. Coprolites are fossilized poop. In some caves, uh, Scientists have found mammoth cap copper lights that were preserved so well that when they break them open, they still smell fresh despite being thousands of years old. Then we have drill holes. Drill holes are in particular something that my friend who helped me make this presentation, who's given this presentation in the past to my classes when we had them in person, was Dr. Joshua Slattery. He studied these um, and he said that every time you're at the beach and you see a clamshell with a hole in it, it's a borehole. The hole is from another predatory organism, which is actually a type of sea snail, and it slowly bores a hole through the clamshell while sitting on top of it and using its foot to hold it closed. Uh, what it uses to actually drill into the shell is called a radula, which is a tongue-like that a tongue-like thing it has that's actually covered in really tiny teeth that are about as hard as diamonds. Once it gets through, it actually eats the clam alive, and that, I think that's pretty terrifying. Um, but <laughs> It's really cool because these boreholes, these drill holes, have, have been found on shells that are hundreds of years old, showing that this type of predator-prey uh, relationship has been around for a while. Another trace fossil is footprints. These can be preserved if they're made in very soft sediments that are covered and able to dry out, essentially leaving footprints. Uh, these are particularly rare trace fossils because they can be very easily disturbed. 
And I think lastly is gnaw marks or, or scratch marks. Gnaw and claw marks are left behind on the bones of different organisms, and these can be connected to different pr pr predators. So for example, like velociraptors, pterodactyls, mosasaurs, T-rexes, based on the size of maybe the teeth or the claw marks. And you can tell maybe if this was like more scavenger, you can also see how different predators would eat when they were killing something, which is pretty cool. Let's go over some different modes of fossil preservation. There are two major types of preservation. One that leaves the organism or material completely unchanged or unaltered. Um, and then there's one that changes the material, replacing it with other minerals. Let's start with unaltered. The first type of unaltered uh, fossil we'll talk about is entombment or encrustation, meaning the organism is trapped in some sort of sap, like tree sap, becoming amber. Materials or the organism itself gets trapped inside this coating and it leads to it being perfectly preserved. We've all seen Jurassic Park and we all know that inside the cane he had um, the piece of amber with the fossilized mosquito in it that he got DNA from in order to help create uh, these dinosaurs. And and this, this leads, this is true, they are perfectly preserved inside, that's not too crazy. Um, whether or not people would actually use it to create dinosaurs is a little bit more far-fetched. Um, since amber is a huge commodity though in the jewelry business, many paleontologists end up buying amber with organisms inside on eBay or in a, from a jewelry company just to get the samples they need to study. Another type of um, unaltered fossilization is refrigeration. Essentially, the materials are trapped inside ice and are perfectly preserved or mummified. An example of this is actually this baby mammoth. Uh, it was found so well preserved that scientists were able to find its mother's milk in its belly. And then we have altered. Uh, altered fossils means that parts of it has been replaced by another material. Um, Permineralization is the first altered we're going to talk about. And essentially what happens here is the spaces between the pores, like here, between the cell, cell pores, uh, gets water in it. And so then it's replaced with quartz or calcite. And this happens as water gets into the tissue and evaporates, leaving behind mineral growths, kind of like how it happens in a geode. Uh, this can replace even some of the areas within the cell itself. Um, and this fills spaces down to the microscopic level and turns an organism into rock while still leaving actual original materials present, like what we have right here with uh, petrified wood. Another one is replacement. So with, with permineralization, you're not replacing everything. There is still original material left within the sample. But with altered, it's completely replaced. Tissue is replaced with minerals. Um, for example, a shell buried in the mud or ground causes the shell to dissolve, leaving a mold, and then water gets into the mold and makes an entire cast out of pyrite, such as this pyrite ammonite. Then we have carbonization. Carbonization is the result of the tissue being reduced to a thin film of carbon, such as with this fern. Now this occurs when a fossil, like a leaf, is buried. The remains are then heated, probably due to metamorphism, of the rock around it, maybe mountain building, uh, causing the leaf to then essentially cook away, leaving behind a film of carbon. Occasionally, this gets replaced with a silver or gold film, which is actually pretty, really pretty. Uh, but paleontology has a very critical role in geology. Uh, it's part of why we have the geologic timescale. Part of what paleontology is overall used for is making and updating the geologic timescale that we have here which is then used to make geologic maps with what is called relative dating, meaning it's not something definitive like we use using radiometric dating or geochronology. If you notice, each section of the time scale is actually color-coded. This is very specific, and we'll see why these colors are important in a second. It's actually for these. These are geologic maps. Each color shows a section of sediment, so you can see in here, like each color is represented, and you can see where maybe it's modeled or maybe we have, if we go back a layer, you'll notice some like this pink, green, and teal colors even showing up in here. We have the pink up here, showing that we have really old sediments being exposed up here, but down here we're seeing a lot of yellow and 
lighter greens, which it means we're back in the Cenozoic or Neogene. And so what's happening here is you're having a lot of sediments coming, actually getting eroded down. And so they're essentially coming down here as they're being deposited in the ocean. Uh, over here, we have the Rocky Mountains. And so you're having erosion up here, just like you have erosion going on over here where the Appalachians are. Uh, and the, because these mountains were pushed up, the sediments have eroded away. And so you're having the older sediments on top. Uh, so we have, like I said, the Appalachian Mountains over here where they have been uplifted. You have a lot being removed. And then we have Florida. Florida's cool. <laughs> Florida has a lot of interesting things going on. Um, we can see areas where the older sediments like up here are, are very apparent. These are some of the oldest sediment layers. And then we have other areas like over here where it's very young. Um, Florida has a combination of older and younger layers, which is why we find a lot of really cool things in Florida, particularly shells and fossilized sea, sea, sea life. Um, older layers have been exposed while younger sediments have been deposited on top. And certain areas of Florida have older sediments due to being actually Florida being in two separate pieces at one point. And it's actually this area that ended up getting infilled layer by sediments coming down and being deposited. Um, and so now we have, which is where we are in like the Tampa area. Okay, how do we determine the age of sedimentary rock? Well, that's relative dating. Uh, this is the method of determining the relative order of past events, i.e. Uh, the age of the object in comparison to another object without necessarily determining absolute age. Remember, we're not doing rel uh, radiometric dating. We're not doing absolute dating. We're doing relative. We know that this rock at the bottom should be the oldest rock and this rock on top should be younger and varying youngingness as we go up. Um, and that's actually the law of superposition, which we're going to go over in uh, two lectures. Now let's talk about William Smith. William Smith is the founder of biostratigraphy. He was a mining engineer in England going down a mine shaft when he noticed because uh, the mine shaft elevator wasn't a closed elevator, it was more like a chair going down. Uh, he noticed that there were these layers of dead organisms in the sediment as he went down. And he noticed that these fossils occurred in specific orders. Uh, he then used that to kind of map out the area around the mine and then moved to go throughout England, mapping out all of the rocks, uh, determining a relative age for each layer. And this was used to determine where resources would most likely be found, such as cold, iron, tin, which is a huge commodity in industrial Europe. He went on to go all over England and Wales and even some parts of Scotland, creating the first geologic map using paleontology. It was not the first geolo geological map made. There was one made in America, but this was the first one to be as expansive and to be based on paleontology. Uh, the first edition of this map was published in 1815, and it was really, really useful, and it led to him actually going off across Europe doing similar things, going off and mapping. And he picked colors based on um, a soil layer map that he saw, where they used colors to differentiate different types of soil. And um, even though he came with wealth, uh, he ended up dying a pauper, which is kind of sad. What is biostratigraphy? Biostratigraphy is the study of dividing up and correlating or sorting rock layers using fossils. These fossils are independent of sedimentary rock. Meaning you could have sandstone that ends and then a layer of mudstone, but they all have the same pro fossil present showing they came from the same era or the same epoch. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about the basis of biostratigraphy. The first one is faunal succession. It is the systematic progression of fossils through time. This means that extinct fossils, like organisms that just completely died out, don't reappear in younger rocks, creating a predictable pattern such as the Nautilus should appear in this time period, but not in, let's say, the Cenozoic time period. Uh, we find life in the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. Paleo standing for old, Meso middle, Ceno recent. But we won't find Paleozoic fossils in the Cenozoic fossil, um, and these er errors are actually separated by mass extinction events. And then we have evolution, which is essentially faunal succession. Um, it is the generic variation and inheritance that happens within a group, um, changing environmental conditions, 
natural selection occurs with evolution, and it leads to paleontologists being able to track speciation of a group. Mass extinction events are when you have a rapid global de decrease in diversity of organisms, meaning that, let's say, 90% of organisms died out. That is a mass extinction event. Um, it's identified by a sharp change in the diversity and abundance of multicellular organisms. There are five major extinction events, and it really only lasts about over 500 million years because that's where our larger fossils remain. 11% of geologic time is things like dinosaurs and mastodons, like elephants and mammoths. Um, everything else is smaller organisms like nautiloids, um, clams, different types of sea life. And then we also have 4 billion years of Precambrian life. Precambrian means pre-life, uh, because for the longest time, scientists believed that there was no life before the Paleozoic. But in reality, it's not that there was just no life, it's either that there was no life or that it was microscopic. And all we have of this microscopic life is kind of like remnants of them, like chemical traces. Sometimes we get things like diatoms, but they're very difficult to date. Um, and then we have the method. The method is to determine ranges of fossils in a section, then divide them into biozones based on their species. This allows scientists to create biolithostratic column independent of rock types, meaning that the fossil is not just going to show up in sandstone. To do this, scientists use something called an index fossil. An index fossil is a fossil used to determine biozones. It must be readily available, abundant, widespread, globally. The shorter the age range, the better. It has to be readily preserved, have rapid evolution, and be easily identifiable. And here are some examples of index fossils. In the Cenozoic era, for example, we have these different types of clams, and we can see how these clams actually evolved over time into what we have today. Types of index fossils include microfossils, which are great for finding oil, macrofossils, which are primarily um, going to be the remains of sea creatures, dinosaurs, and mammals. Um, microfossils are going to be made up of diatoms, pollen, diatoms like what we see in here, uh, pollen from, from the flora, and the microscopic bits of, of fish jaws. With these, we know that based on fossils, what age range a layer is. And so this is how we end up using index fossils. We know that, for example, fossil group A is going to be in this layer, and fossil group B should be in this layer, and over here we have fossil group C. And we know that here, this isn't B because they still have the same index fossils as C and are missing the fossils from B, meaning that B probably eroded away at the fourth location. Um, how do we know that index fossils and biostones define an area? Like, how, how do we correlate it to an actual age? Um, we use radiometric analysis or geochronology. Uh, for example, we uh, scientists will actually radiometrically date ash beds associated with specific index fossils to constrain the age and temporal range of biozones. They'll find ash beds in stratigraphic columns near fossils and can figure out how old the fossils are to about 30 million years. And depending on how old the fossil is depends on if we can do actual dating like carbon dating on it. Radiometrically dated ash beds associated with um, other ash beds can help identify ages for biozones overall. Uh, another thing that they use is magnetostratigraphy. Uh, magnetostratigraphy has to do with the way that our magnetic field works. So we have magnetic north and then we have reversed poles, which is where magnetic south becomes what we know of as the north pole. Um, this shift in the poles occurs due to magnetic shifts of Earth's polarity. And you can look at the magnetic polarity in rocks and date biostratigraphic layers. The polarity is recorded in lava flows, the mid-ocean ridge, and volcanic deposits. It allows us to determine the exact ages of the crust. So then we can look at a magnetic polarity in rocks, date biostratigraphic layer, and then we know that in, in here we have this particular index fossil, which means it should be in this age range, um, which allows us to say, okay, we know that over here we had this um, a reverse polarity that happened two million years ago. So we know this this layer here with these fossils, because these fossils were found in that layer, are also about two million years. Therefore, this layer should be about two million years. Um, we're going to go over um, magnetostratigraphy and radiometric dating a little more in our next lecture. 
And thank you all for listening. Don't forget to post any and all questions, and I'll see you guys next time.